quem não conhece, a gente está com... Eu acho que todo mundo conhece, a gente está falando aqui com Kenny Rampton. Kenny é o trompetista da Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. É, eu toco com o Ito Marsalis. É, e assim, antes de, de tocar né, com, com o Ito Marsalis, de chegar nesse ponto, é, eu gostaria de falar um pouco da história dele. Ele é de Las Vegas, é, ele se formou na Universidade de Las Vegas, é, depois fez, estudou, estudou na Berkeley também. É, e depois se mudou para Nova York em 1990 e tocou com o Ray Charles, é, foi o primeiro trompete da Minas Orchestra. É, e desde 2010, além de ter entrado para Jazz at Lincoln Center, ele também ele é trompetista da Sesame Street, que é, como a gente chama aqui, é, é Muppets Baby. É, ele, ele, ele trabalha com esse... Ele é o trompetista desse programa, então toda semana ele está gravando é, isso tudo. Assim. Então, ele é um grande amigo nosso, o Kenny. É, toda vez que ele vem ao Brasil, a gente se encontra e troca ideias. Assim, ele é um cara muito, muito, muito legal. Bom, eu vou começar a fazer algumas perguntas para eles. Então, se vocês puderem, já vão mandando aqui, que eu estou vendo aqui da, do, do ladinho. Tá meio, eu, eu acho que está demorando um pouco para chegar essas mensagens. Mas eu vou eu vou falando aí aqui para vocês. So Kenny, thank you so much uh, uh, for accept our invite. It's an honor to have you here. So we are trying to to make our quarantine better. But also, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's so hard to to stay at home. And uh, so we are doing all those interviews to you know to make the space uh, more more easy you know uh, yeah. so I, i'd like to know your about your start i already told it i, I already told to the audience about your beginning uh, you, you you were born in las vegas and you you study in, in las vegas university maybe at nevada university I, i don't know and then you went to new york and played with ray charles and mingles band and, and And since uh, 2010, you were playing with the um, Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra and in the Sesame Street, right? Am I right? Yeah, that's all accurate. That, in a nutshell, yeah. Yeah, cool. So, how how how, how was the all the? You can tell me more about your beginning and then how old are you and your teachers and your first experiences and, and okay. everything. All right. Well, first of all, it's great to see see you, Otavio. I yeah, miss you, man. You yeah, I miss you too, man. You, you good? You're dealing well with this um, quarantine thing? You all right? Your family's good? Yeah, it's everything good, I saw man. your little boy earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <It's> so cute. <laughs> yeah, it's adorable. And yeah, Bruno's you, good. Man. Daniel, yeah. man, I miss all you guys. Yeah, I miss I, you too, I hope man. to get back to, uh, get to Sao, Sao Paulo again soon, man. Okay. So, so very soon, soon, I hope. Great to see you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my beginnings, man, you know, my parents were both musicians. Um, sure. My father was a percussionist um, and they, they settled down in Las Vegas um, in the 50s, in the 1950s, because there was a lot of work in Las Vegas. Um, mm -hmm. And my dad played with everybody who came through Vegas with all the Rat Pack guys, Frank Sinatra and uh, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. Um, the, rat, the Rat Pack? He played yeah. with the Rat Pack? Really? Yeah. Oh, he toured that's with so Elvis. Cool. Yeah, he toured with Elvis Presley. Um, toured with. Was a trumpet player? He was a trumpet player. He played percussion. Percussion. Sorry. Okay. 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 Sorry. You yeah, played percussion. Uh -huh. um, but I remember from the time I was a little kid. You know, my mom played piano. She studied to be a concert pianist, but um, gave that up to raise a family. But I always played played organ in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, so my my earliest lessons were really like sitting on the organ bench with my mom in church and she would nod her head when it was time to turn the page. I was the page turner <laughs> cool. you know? and I would watch the music go by and, and she taught me how to read music so I could be better at that. And that's, mm -hmm. those are my first earliest lessons was really from my mom learning how to read, read music so I could turn pages for her. Um, mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. my dad used to take me to rehearsals and concerts, you know, and, and shows that he was playing from the time I was a baby. So, um, you know, I got to see all the guys, all the Rat Pack guys. And, cool, man. Um, That's weird. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And when I, when I was like 11, 12 years old, I started playing the trumpet. 
I started at 11. Mm -hmm. I think it was when I was 12. Um, actually, when I, when I started trumpet, my dad bought me a Doc Severinsen record called Rhapsody mm -hmm. for Now. Mm -hmm. And he said, when you can play every note on this record, then you can call yourself a real <laughs> trumpet player. Oh, God. So I'm so still working on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> cool. let, let, okay, let, let me translate to, uh, to this part. Então, okay. pessoal, eu, eu perguntei para ele, bom, primeiro a gente, ele falou um pouco, ele perguntou como tá a minha família, como tá o, o pessoal aqui de Assumbra de Festa, o Bruno, o Daniel, tal, falando que, que é muito, pô, sente falta da gente, que é muito divertido estar com a gente e tal, e espera chegar, estar aqui em São Paulo é, o mais breve possível. Bom, eu perguntei para ele um pouco sobre esse início dele, ele falou que o, tanto o pai quanto a mãe dele eram músicos, eram musicistas, né, músicos, é, o pai dele era percussionista e a mãe dele era é, pianista, concertista pianista, mas quem não vivia disso, né, por conta do, de todos os, os, afazeres, os outros afazeres que ela tinha, mas o pai dele era percussionista e ele, eles vieram para Las Vegas, a família dele veio para Las Vegas porque tinha muito trabalho em Las Vegas, né, é, é, para músicos, né, então eles vieram para cá e o pai dele tocava com todo mundo e eles tocaram com um negócio que chama The Rat Pack, The Rat Pack era, era, um, era um grupo, era tipo um trio, era o, o Frank Sinatra, o, the, the, o Kenny, the, the, the Rat Pack, it was the Frank Sinatra, and Sammy Davis Jr., and which one is the... Dean Martin? Dean, Mar Dean, 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 yeah, Dean Martin. Those are the main Dean three, Martin. and then also, what's the other guy's name? Uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. What's the other guy's name, Shaws? Uh, Sinatra, Sammy Davis. Sammy Davis. So that's my lady in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Sinatra, Sammy Davis. Dean Martin. Dean Martin. Joey Lawrence or Joey. Joey Joey something, yeah. Joey Lawrence, it's a, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyways. So, o The Red Pack era, era um show, gente, que era muito legal, que, que era muito legal, que era um show meio de comédia e de canto, então tinha o Frank Sinatra, tinha o Sammy Davis Jr., que é um super cantor, e tinha o Dean Morgan, era um show de comédia, e a, a Big Band Count Basie também acompanhava uh, o The Red Pack, e tem um, um, um filme sobre o The, The Red Pack, assim, que seria... Isso é muito legal se todo mundo puder assistir, é muito bom, a trilha sonora é sensacional. Pô, e aí ele ia em todos esses ensaios com o pai dele, ia em todos os um shows e tal. Então foi assim que ele meio que, que começou. E aí ele falou que quando ele come, começou a tocar, ele começou a tocar um cornet, o pai dele deu um disco do Doc Severson e falou assim para ele, quando você tocar todas essas, todas essas músicas, você vai ser um trompetista de verdade. Ele brincou que até hoje ele está tentando tocar todas aquelas músicas. Ok, Kenny. Can go ahead. <laughs> ok, so, um, you know, just because my dad and all the people that he played with he used to take me to his rehearsals, you know, so mm -hmm. I remember I was, I've been playing trumpet for a year or two. Um, I was like 12 or 13, and my dad brought me to a rehearsal with Doc Severance, and he was, he was playing Doc <laughs> show. Cool. You yeah. know, so I got to sit, you know, like two feet in front of Doc while he was playing and, and you know, warming up and, You know, and I got to ask him questions at that time, and it just inspired me so much, man. So, I, you know, I really had a pretty amazing upbringing, you know, not to mention Doc, yes. but the guys who my dad played with regularly, like Rick Baptist, who's <laughs> legendary trumpet player, played on over a thousand movie uh, yeah. soundtracks, and he's in L.A. He's now, I think, the, was he the vice president or the president of the Musicians Union in L.A. now? Uh -huh. um, legendary trumpet player. The first trumpet I ever played was actually Rick's trumpet. Um, I don't know, should I speak shorter so you can translate, Otavio? No, no, it's okay, it's great. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so um, my first trumpet teacher, when I, you know, got a little bit older, got into, uh, I think it was junior high school, uh, was Tommy Perello, who's another, like, legendary lead trumpet player, played lead trumpet for Harry James, um, a phenomenal lead trumpet player. He was the first called lead trumpet player in... Uh, in Las Vegas for decades. And he's still actively playing in, in Vegas. I'm not sure what exactly how old he is now, but I think he's in his eighties and still playing great and a great, just a great friend and, and great mentor to me still. Um, he was mm -hmm. my first teacher. Um, then when I got into high school, uh, I met up with a gentleman named Walt Blanton, Walter Blanton. And mm -hmm. Walt became like one of my greatest mentors and teachers in life. He was like a second father to me. He really cool. took me under his wing. He never charged me a dime for less. And he was always, 
he was so giving. He would buy me records and turn me on to Miles Davis and to Kenny Wheeler and Freddie Hubbard and Maurice Andre. And Walt, Walt was just phenomenal. Um, I played at UNLV uh, after high school. I went to school at UNLV. Um, uh, I was there for two uh, years studying with Walt in Vegas. And then um, after two years, I auditioned for the Berkeley School of Music in Boston. And I went to school uh -huh. there for two years, studied with Jeff Stout and Greg Hopkins while I was in Boston. And also Claudio Roditi. He came to Berkeley to give a master class. And I talked with him afterwards. He gave me his number. So I would commute back and forth between, uh, between Boston and Brooklyn, New, New York, York. Uh -huh. to get lessons with Claudio. And oh, um, they had really cheap. It was like, I think, $11 for a round trip ticket on the bus back then. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. So I'd come to New York, spend the day, get lessons with Claudio, have, you know, have dinner in New York, hear some music, and then go back to Boston you know, on, on the weekends. Uh -huh. <clears throat> then while I was at Berkeley, I won a scholarship from the Boston Jazz Society. They gave one every year to a student at Berkeley and to a student at New England Conservatory as most outstanding student of the school. Um, the pri the pr previous year, they gave it to, I think, Antonio Hart at Berkeley, mm -hmm. who's a phenomenal the player. player. Yeah, uh -huh. phenomenal musician. Yeah. Um, yes. In my second year, they gave it to me. And cool. um, it, was, it was a $2,000 scholarship to continue my studies, but they gave the money wow. directly to me instead of the school. So... I used that money to move to New York, and I left. <laughs> and um, I've been in New York since. I moved to New York with a great piano player named Jeff Kieser. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff is another phenomenal musician. He almost instantaneously got the gig. I'm almost in instantaneously got the gig with Art Blake and the Jazz Messengers, um, who I used to go here every night. I got to sit in with with Art Blakey back then. And um, then Jeff moved out and. Bass player Christian McBride moved in to Jeff's room. So Christian and I were roommates for some time. And, um, you know, back then, none of us, you know, were, we, we were all just getting started. You know, none of us mm -hmm. had really made uh, much of a splash in the scene yet. We were just getting started, getting our feet wet, learning the music and um, starting to get known. <coughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Let, 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 let me translate. É, bom, pessoal, então ele estava falando, ele começou a falar um pouco mais, né? Depois que ele, ele, ele coloca o primeiro professor dele, ele estava falando que em todos esses, esses ensaios, teve uma vez, uma vez que o pai dele levou ele ao ensaio da, do Doc Severinsen, e ele conversou bastante com o Doc Severinsen, foi realmente um turning point na, na, na vida dele ter, ter visto o Doc Severinsen do canal vivo, é... Ele falou que, fora esse lance do Doc Service, de todas as pessoas que o pai dele tocava, o pai dele tocava, é, com, por exemplo, com o Rick Bappett, que é, hoje é, ele, é, ele é presidente da Union lá em Los Angeles, né, como se fosse o sindicato dos músicos, e para quem não conhece, o Rick Bappett foi um trompetista que gravou centenas e centenas de, de trilhas sonoras de, de, de filme, então assim, ele, ele é um, um trompetista muito legendário, assim, é muito importante no cenário, né, de, de, de música comercial, de trilha sonora e tudo mais. E tanto que o primeiro trompete que o Kenny Remington tocou foi um trompete do Rick Baptist, né, que, que ajudou. Bom, aí ele começou a ter aula é, com o um primeiro trompete da Big Band do Harry James. É, acho que ele, o nome dele é Tom... É, the name of your first, the, 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 your first teacher is Tommy Perello. Yes, Tommy Perello. Tommy Perello, yeah. Que foi o primeiro trom... Tommy, ok. É, Tommy Parello, que foi o, o, o cara era o primeiro trompete da, da Big Band do Harry James, ele é né, primeiro trompete é, super ativo por muitos, muitos e muitos anos, e depois ele começou a ter aula com um outro professor, que chama Walker, que foi muito importante para a vida dele, que ele fala que foi como se fosse um segundo pai para ele, comprava discos para ele, estava sempre, e ele era o primeiro trompete também, é, que está vivo até hoje, tá, toca e sempre foi um primeiro trompete muito ativo lá em Las Vegas, e foi um cara que sempre é, ajudou muito ele, comprava discos do Miles, disco do, do Fred Hubbard, do, do Kenny Wheeler e tudo mais, e logo em seguida, é, depois de dois anos estudando na Universidade de Nevada com, com o Walter, Walter é, ele foi para Berkeley e começou a estudar lá, e aí tem a Boston Jazz Society que dá uma, uma como se fosse a sociedade de jazz de Boston dá uma, uma bolsa de, de estudos para Berkeley, né? 
é, os melhores estudantes, né, tanto da Berkeley quanto da, da New England Conservatory. E no primeiro ano, quem ganhou essa bolsa foi o Antonio Hart, que é um saxofonista muito pesada lá em Nova York, ele toca sax alto. E no primeiro ano ganhou o Antonio Hart, no segundo ano ele ganhou. E ele ganhava como se fosse dois mil dólares por mês para pagar a faculdade, mas ele economizou, ele economizou todo esse dinheiro para mudar para Nova York. Então, quando ele mudou para Nova York, ele morou junto com um pianista que tocava com o Art Blake e Jazz Messengers. E, então, é, ele ficava sempre indo aos concertos do, do, do Art Blake e Jazz Messengers, dava canja e tudo mais. E também, durante esse tempo dele lá na, na Berkeley, ele teve aula também com o Claudio Roditi, né, o brasileiro Claudio Roditi. Enquanto ele morava em Boston, ele pegava um ônibus, é, fala que custava 11 dólares, ia até Nova York é, no final de semana, tinha aula com o Rodit, assistia os sons e depois voltava para Boston. Então, aí, depois que ele, ele começou a assistir o show do Art Blake e tal, tudo mais, e aí o pianista que tocava o Art Blake, né, que, que era amigo dele, saiu da banda, saiu do, do, do casa que eles moravam e entrou o Christian McBride, que é um contrabaixista. Ok! Let's go ahead, Kenny. <laughs> All right. All right. So back in those days when I first moved to New York, like I said, you know, Jeff Keezer, Christian McBride, uh, Antonio just moved to town, Josh Redman. Um, he was in Boston as well. We used to jam together all the time in, uh, mm -hmm. in Boston. Uh, Roy Hargrove, um, Dwayne Burno, so, so many great players who are now um, – really legendary players in this music. But back then we were kids, just moved to New York. We used to jam together in each other's houses, each other's apartments, and we just wanted to play. We were writing music, challenging each other, writing new music. And um, cool. it was a very exciting time in my life, you know? And then mm -hmm. we all started to get gigs, started to work. Um, Christian started to work with Freddie Hubbard. Jeff Keezer was working with Art Blakey, um, <laughs> you know? And I got, really? I got called... Good roommates, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, we were meeting and recommending each other for gigs. And, yeah. You know, so, um, and then I um, I wasn't making any money playing music. I was, you know, I was actually playing in the subway, playing on the street um, for change and working as a, as a, I had a few different odd jobs. I worked as a security guard. I worked in a bank. Um, really? As a temp, yeah. Um, to, to pay the rent and, and I was playing for free anywhere that I could and I met a trumpet player in a, in a reading band you know there was just guys getting together just to play for the sake of playing and he was a uh, trumpet player with Ray Charles and uh -huh. he, he took my card and um, a month or two later his name was Jeff K he's still around I think he's in LA now um, but a month or so later I got a call Uh, from Ray Charles saying he needed a trumpet player and he heard about me through Jeff Kay who was in the band and asked would I be interested and so I went on the road at that at that point I quit the job at the bank and, um, <laughs> Thanks God. Went, and went on tour with Ray Charles and uh -huh. um, and never looked back um, yes playing with Ray Charles you know every day was such a deep lesson you know yes. he never had a bad night he was one of the most phenomenal musicians who ever lived Yeah, in, in any genre, on any instrument, his vocals, his p piano playing, it was just absolutely incredible. Every note was dripping with soul. It was just, it was such a deep lesson in, in how to, to play music. Okay. And when you're a student in college, you know, a lot of guys are trying to play technically fast, a lot of notes and impress each other. That's not what music is. And I learned what music truly was from Ray Charles from playing it. Yes. Song. Oh, man. You know? Great. Yeah, let me translate that. That's very strong yeah. message, man. Really. <risos> Bom, aí ele tá, estava falando aí depois que ele estava lá em Nova York, aí é, ele morava, né, junto com o Christian McBride, né, contra baixista que tocava na época estava tocando com o Fred Hubbard e com o pianista do, do Art Blake e e aí eles trocavam os trabalhos e tal, não sei o quê, mas uma coisa que muito interessante que eu não sabia, ele trabalhava de segurança de banco, gente, é, só para pagar o aluguel. Então, ele estava sempre procurando, assim, ele tocava de graça onde poderia para aparecer, né? 
E aí ele fez um desses, um desses contatos que ele estava tocando, ele fez amizade com um cara que indicou ele para tocar com o Ray Charles, é, o cantor Ray Charles, acho que vocês devem conhecer, né? E, e aí o Ray Charles, ele, ele falou que foi a grande escola dele, foi o Ray Charles, assim, por exemplo, todo mundo na universidade fica preocupado em tocar notas rápidas e tocar agudo, e, na verdade, a grande escola dele foi o Ray Charles, falou que não tinha nada disso, era simplesmente pura música, 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 todo o tempo, e, 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 assim, ele falou que o Ray Charles foi um dos músicos mais fenomenais que já pisaram na Terra, porque ele nunca teve um dia ruim, foi, tipo, impressionante. Ok, Kenny. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, where is the, the Ray Charles and and you left the bank? And what? Yeah, you left the you left the, the job at the bank and and everything. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. Can go ahead. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to share this on Facebook uh, with my with my nonprofit, but that's okay. I'll find that. I'll figure that out later. Um, So, you know, Ray was, it was a great lesson. It was phenomenal playing with him. Um, and uh, then when I came back to New York, came off the road, people started to know who I was. Hey, that's that guy who played with Ray Charles. And so you start to, you know, build a reputation, you know, and people, hey, I want that trumpet player who plays with Ray Charles because I'm attached to Ray Charles, right? So they start calling me and that gives me more gigs. And, you know, one thing leads to another. Things start to snowball. So I went from Ray Charles Band to working with Panama Francis and the Savoy Sultans. Panama, I don't know if you're hip to him, was a no, phenomenal no. drummer. Mm -hmm. He was an older cat. He used to lead the band um, at the Savoy Ballroom. And um, it, it was another incredible education playing and touring with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started working with uh, Jimmy McGriff, uh, the famous jazz blues organist. Um, started touring with his quintet. Um, I left Ray Charles. Um, after close to a year of touring with him, toured all over the world with Ray. And, and you know, one thing led to another. So Jimmy McGriff and then uh, Lionel Hampton, Illinois Jaquette, uh, big bands. Um, quite a few others. I spent several years with George Gruntz, a Swiss composer. He had kind of an all-star band from all, all guys from New York. Alex Sipiagin, Lou Soloff. Um, Marvin Stamm, Mike Mossman, Terrell Stafford were all some of the trumpet players who went through George Gruntz's band when I, when I did it. Um, Kenny Wheeler, wow. uh, Frank wow. Rossetti. Um, uh -huh. it, it was a lot of fun, and we, we toured all over the world. Yeah, um, that's cool. And um, the Mingus Big Band, which I was a part of for close to 20 years. I was on a Grammy-winning winning record with the Mingus Big Band. Um, Winton. Um, I, I did a series of videos with Winton when I first met him called Marsalis on Music. Um, yeah, was, yeah, uh, in Boston, right? In, in Tanglewood, yeah. In Tanglewood, yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. that. I remember to watch it, to watch it in TV. <clears throat> on TV. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was on that in, in the band with Winton. It was really? always mostly younger guys. And that was the, kind of the beginning of the Lincoln Center days for Winton. He uh -huh. had the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. But this was something separate from that. It was some of the guys from that, but it was it was more younger guys than the jazz and Link, or than the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra at the time. Um, and Dan Miller was playing lead trumpet in that, who's one of my favorite lead trumpet players who's ever lived. Yeah. I love Dan's playing. Yeah, um, it was awesome. <clears throat> so I met Winton then. That had to have been I don't know 20, 25 years ago, a long time ago. And um, had a good rapport with him. Um, I started working with John Hendricks. Um, so, you know, I was kind of juggling all these gigs between George Grunts, Lincoln's Big Band, John Hendricks, and Lincoln Center. Whoever would call first is who I would accept the gig from. And, okay. you know, I'm, I was freelancing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was a period where I had to turn down um, gigs from people because um, I was busy with other people, you know, when you're freelancing like that. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so I, I kind of lived that way for quite a while, just kind of freelancing and juggling gigs with, with different people. Who How many years? How many years? Yes. Oh God, that, yeah. that was probably 1993 or 1994 till, um, 
till around 2000, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That I was kind of juggling all those gigs. And, um, mm-hmm. and then um, I had a kid. And when that happened, I decided I didn't want to travel so much. And I wanted okay. to find some more stability. Okay. So just to, to, that, like that? Yeah, to that. Okay. To, to okay. your... E de, de, de Bart, não, for your kid. Ok. Bom, pessoal, aí eu mereço. Aí ele voltou, ele tava tocando com com, com o Ray Charles e tal e tudo mais. Ele ficou um ano tocando. Aí ele voltou para Nova York. Aí quando ele voltou para Nova York, pra Nova York começou, todo mundo começou a querer chamar ele, né? Tipo, ah, porra, o, o trompetista do, do, do Ray Charles e tal. Então ele começou a tocar pra caramba. Começou a tocar com um baterista chamado. What's the name? Panama? What? The, what's the last name? Francis. É, assim, Panama Francis, ele começou a tocar com, com um baterista chamado Panama Francis e depois começou a tocar com um organista de, de blues e começou a tocar com a Amigos Big Band e, e começou a fazer freelancer para tudo quanto é lado, sempre trabalhando bastante. E aí, gente, vocês sabem uma, uma série que passava muitos anos atrás na cultura com o Inton Marsalis apresentando, é, que era lá em Tanglewood, que era em Boston, é, uhum. o Kenny estava nessa, naquela banda desse programa educacional do Marsalis tipo, acho que faz 25 anos já então ele sempre teve um bom contato com, com o Marsalis desde, desde então então ele começou a, a trabalhar freelancer pra caramba então entre bandas e, e tocou com Lionel Hampton também e começou a trabalhar bastante então isso foi meio de 93 até 2000 ele foi um trompetista 100% freelancer e, e aí, a partir de 2000, é, ele teve filho. Ele teve um filho e decidiu não, é, não, não mais viajar. Ok. Ok, Kenny. We have some comments here. Alex Piagin saying, hey, Kenny, great to hear you, bro. Sasha, And, what's up, buddy? Man, I miss yeah. you. Yeah, Brandon Soloff. I think hey, it's Brandon. maybe. Yeah. yeah. His nephew. Yeah, his nephew. Cool. Yeah, I... Oh, I see Islam. What's up, Islam? All right. Yeah, Islam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so your your um, about your kid. Your kid was born. Yeah. So you know, I was working, doing all you know, all this touring, and you know, but it was sporadic, and you couldn't depend on it. You know, mm-hmm. you know I was working a lot back then with Chico O'Farrell, uh, the Afro Cuban mm-hmm. band, and with Babo Valdez later. Um, played a lot of Latin music um, with them, but. Um, Uh, I had a kid on the way, and I had, coincidentally, two tours canceled, and I had no income. And at the time, you know, my, my wife at the time was taking maternity leave, so we had, like, no income. And yes. I was like, man, I got to figure something out, and um, just happened to run into a friend. Why yeah, just, like my, is it just, my, like, just like my quarantine. <laughs> no <Yeah>. income. <laughs> I understand. It's rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, I, I happened to run into a friend who um, I live on. Uh, I live in Hell's Kitchen in, in Midtown Manhattan, and I ran into a friend on my block who just parked his car and was going to do a Broadway show. Mm-hmm. I hadn't seen him in years, and he was show, playing the show um, Chicago on Broadway. And we, you know, he was a little early, so we stood and talked for 10, 15 minutes, and kind of caught up. And he asked me if I wanted to come in and sub on the show. His name is Daryl Shaw, uh-huh. and um, great trumpet player. So I said, yeah, man, absolutely. So he um, kind of was the first one to open the door for me into doing Broadway. Uh-huh. You know, so I went, to, um, I went to the show, sat and watched. Um, it was Daryl Shaw and Johnny Frost, who, if you don't know Johnny Frost, he's a legendary yes. Broadway commercial <laughs> trumpet player, one of the greats of all time. Um, yeah, he is. And... Um, That was the first show I subbed on, and it was playing with Johnny Frost, and it went well. And you know, I passed, you know, passed the first test and started uh-huh. subbing regularly in Chicago, and then started subbing at, at several different shows. Um, Glenn Drews brought me into uh, the Drowsy Chaperone was the name of the show. Um, yeah, I played that. I played that. I played yeah. it as well. The yeah. fun show. Yeah. Um, uh, who was it? Frank Green and. Um, uh, uh, Nick Marcion and, and Dave Rogers were doing um, the producers. I started subbing there. 
And, you know, you start subbing on Broadway, you know, one show leads to another. If you do good, you know, reputations can get broken in a night, though, if you have a bad night. You got to, as a sub, you got to go in, you got to nail it just like the regular um, every yes. single time. And you're only as good as your last performance. If you screw up, they're going to cut you. You know, yes. it's, a very, it's probably the highest pressure situation I've ever been in as a professional yeah. musician. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, you told me this. I, you told me this. These stories about your yeah. anxiety yeah. and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had to deal with a lot of a lot of issues that, that came up. I didn't even know I had with with anxiety and uh -huh. um, getting nerves nerves and all that kind of stuff. But I did, you know. And so I, I went through a period of doing a lot of Broadway. At one point, I was subbing on nine different shows at one time, and some of the shows had two or three books, and I was playing all three books most of the time. Um, <laughs> nine and, shows. Yeah. You know, that's what you got to do. And then <laughs> I started, you know, started getting called for my own shows and ended up, I did a few shows, did, um, uh, what was the first one? I, 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 I um, uh, Finian's Rainbow, it was called. Great, mm. great show. Great music, great show. Um, and then, um, couple, you know, two or three more. And the last one that I did full time was Anything Goes on Broadway and I played the lead book and was lead in, in some solo work had some pleasure mm -hmm. stuff and um, you know so they, they brought me in to play lead because I could play some plunger and knew how to play that style okay uh -huh. um, how many how many shows per week eight eight but yeah. Jesus it's, it's too much. much I think that the, ma the maximum that I played with was seven shows a week with singing in the rain it's it was hard <laughs> yeah, it know, is. It's, it's mentally hard more than physically. Yeah, it's, totally. Yeah, you know, it's your mind plays tricks on you, man. It's weird. Yeah. Um, Bom, let, let me translate. Let me translate. So, então, pessoal, aí, aí quando o filho dele nasceu, é, foi aconteceu uma coisa muito louca assim. Ele tinha duas turnês programadas e as duas turnês foram canceladas, as duas. E aí ele ficou sem dinheiro, totalmente sem dinheiro. Aí ele chegou para um amigo dele que morava no mesmo prédio dele. E falou que tava sem grana e tal, e o cara começou a indicar ele para fazer musical, o cara que tocava na Broadway, né? E como ele começou a fazer sub no musical chamado Chicago, ele começou a fazer, fazer sub lá, e aí assim ele tava falando que o mercado de musical é o mercado mais de alta pressão que existe, porque quando você vai fazer um sub de um musical, você tem que fazer é, do mesmo jeito que o oficial vai fazer. Se você fizer uma coisa ruim, os caras te cortam. E isso é assim no mundo inteiro, inclusive aqui no Brasil. É, 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 um, é um mercado muito, 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 de muita pressão, né? E ele começou a fazer bem os musicais e começou a ser chamado. Um atrás do outro, um atrás do outro, atrás do outro. E ele falou um negócio muito louco. Ele falou que chegou um momento que eu estava fazendo sub em nove musicais e tocando todas as partes. E alguns dos musicais eram três partes de trompete, ele fazia as três partes. Então ele ficou fazendo esse negócio de musical, nove musicais, né? É muita coisa, né? E... Então é isso, até agora é isso. Ok. Yes, sir. Ok, let's go ahead. All right, so... Um, so I was doing Anything Goes, as the last show that I did. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And... Um, actually, that wasn't the last show I did. It closed and I got called for one more. Um, it was called It's All About Me, starred Dame Edna and Michael uhum. Feinstein. Uhum. Um, ah, e o pessoal, e alguns musicais que ele fez, então ele fez Chicago, depois ele, faz, ele fez o Drones de Chaperone, que aqui no Brasil foi chamado de Madrinha Embriagada, é, depois ele fez alguns outros aqui, ele tá falando um monte de nome de musical aqui. Ok, ok, Kenny. I'm sorry, I just recalled that wrong. Uh, it's all about me started before anything goes, but when I was doing it, it's all about me, um, uhum. which was a huge flop, It was a lot of fun, a lot of talent. It was a great band, um, great trumpet section. Brian Pareshi and, um, oh, what's my man's name? Craig Johnson was playing lead trumpet. Killing mm -hmm. band, um, great charts, and it lasted like a week. <laughs> we right. rehearsed, we did the pre previews. Uh, we got reviewed. It got completely panned, and it shut a couple days. Sh the show closed a couple days later. Oh, God, but, really? But during that period when I was doing the show is when I got the call from Winton to join – Uh, Lincoln Center Band full time. Great. Um, it, it was it, it was uh, 2010, right? 
Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So, that, that, bom, pessoal, aí ele tá falando um monte de musicais E aí, é, mais ou menos em 2010 o, o, Aí ele tava fazendo um último show da Broadway Que eles ensaiaram, era uma banda super legal Um musical super legal Depois de duas semanas é, de musical O musical acabou E aí o Winton Marsalis chamou ele para entrar na banda é, Da Lincoln Center para valer Ok, Kenny We stop at the, the moment that Winton called you Called you to, to join the, the band Yeah, so you know, I, I joined the band, started working with with Winton and Jazz Link Center Orchestra, and um, mm. and it was actually after I joined the band with Winton that I got called to do the Broadway show uh, Anything Goes, and was able to work it out to do both. Um, I also got called that same year, which was 2010, to join the uh, band for Sesame Street. It does a TV mm -hmm. show, you know. Um, great trumpet player and a dear friend of mine, Frank Green had been doing it and um, left and they, and I, and I knew Joe Feidler was, a, uh, was and still is a very dear friend of mine, monster musician, trombone player, composer, arranger, writer for television and avant-garde jazz and everything in between. Plays with Eddie mm -hmm. Palmieri. He's a, he's a bad dude. Eddie Palmieri. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. He plays with Joe does. Okay. So um, I got called to do the Sesame Street gig and Those are still my main two gigs to this day. That was like 10 years ago. So I'm still mm -hmm. working with Winton Jazz Lincoln Center and I'm still doing Sesame Street. Um, yeah. And those, you know, doing those gigs has really um, opened up a lot of opportunities for me. Um, through the gig with Winton, um, you get, gain a lot of notoriety. People hear about you. They know who you are. Um, you get heard more. Although it's a big band, you don't get to solo a whole lot, but it's a really good big band, you know, and it's like the the level of musicianship in that band is pretty ridiculous. Yes. Um, you know, and you got to really be on top of your game. You got to work your butt off to, to hang in that trumpet section. And I do. Yeah. I practice a lot um, to keep up, you know, with Winton, Ryan Kaiser, and Marcus Printup. Those are three of the greatest trumpet players ever, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's um, it's always a challenge. Uh, playing with them and um, and also Sesame Street I gotta say is probably the most efficiently run uh, organization that I've ever been a part of like the way that we do recording sessions for Sesame Street and the efficiency that, that we work with from the top down like the people that I deal with Bill Sherman, Joe Feidler uh, Tyler Hartman who, who does the, the sound engineering all these guys are top of the top And so we go into mm -hmm. a session. We, Joe sends us the music ahead of time. And sometimes I look at it. Honestly, sometimes I don't. You know, I just mm -hmm. go in and um, I'm a pretty good sight reader. So I can kind of, I can do okay most of the time. If there's something tricky, he'll give me a heads up. If there's some piccolo trumpet, you know, I always want a heads up for that because I want to practice it for, you know, at least a few days before I go into the studio. But um, Sesame Street is like just efficiency is the name of the game there you just the light goes on and boom you you know mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. you just sight read it one time and that's it that's a take okay quite quite often oh, okay so uh i will translate that so we can enter it on the trumpet kick uh upon your routine and everything okay i'll translate that part well pessoal então assim aí ele entrou na 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 e ao mesmo tempo que ele, ele foi contratado para se juntar à banda da, da Sesame Street, que é o Muppets, né, que a gente tem aqui, que é conhecido aqui no Brasil. E, e ele falou que essa, a Muppets, assim, é uma, é uma, é uma Sesame Street, na verdade, é uma, uma organização a, a mais incrível assim, que ele já tocou. O pessoal toca com uma eficiência absurda, os arranjos são muito... Muito, sabe, são muito bem escritos, o cara chega na hora para gravar e grava na hora, assim, que não tem, a banda é boa, falou que não tem problema nenhum, assim, é, uma, uma, é muito prazeroso trabalhar é, com, esse, com o pessoal da Sesame Street, e, e falou que, que tocar com a Lincoln Center é, é uma tarefa muito complicada, tem que estar muito, 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 muito bem preparado, porque tocar com o Marsalis com, e com o Ryan Kaiser e com o Marcos Pinta é, é muito... O cara são um dos, alguns dos melhores do mundo, são os melhores do mundo, então ele falou que ele estuda muito para conseguir acompanhar o naipe. E aí eu tava falando para ele que depois dessa parte a gente já pode começar na parte trompetística do negócio, 
né, que, qual que seria a rotina dele, tá? Então eu vou fazer, vou perguntar para ele como seria a rotina é, do dia a dia dele. So, uh, Kenny, how how is your routine, your cooking routine on on a daily basis? All right, well, you know, I make sure that I address all the fundamentals every day. You know, I have mm -hmm. a fairly specific routine that I do that comes from the Bill Adams uh, trumpet routine. My, my trumpet teacher in, in Vegas, who I mentioned, who was like my second father, Walter Blanton, um, who to this day had the most gorgeous sound I've ever heard on the trumpet. Um, Walt was a student of Bill Adams at Indiana mm -hmm. University. <coughs> And, um, you know, I can still play for a couple minutes in my apartment. It's not too late. Um, okay. But Bill Adams starts off, has his students do this thing, it's called blowing the pipe, where you take the, um, take out the tuning slide mm -hmm. out, out of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. So you play the, the lead pipe and the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the prettiest tone, it's about a concert E flat, and you can. So that's how I start my day every day, is blowing the pipe mm -hmm. for probably 15 minutes. It's kind of like mm -hmm. long tones, um, long tones and airflow. And then I do a set of long tones <coughs> that span two well, octaves. But you do like, like 25 minutes doing lead pipe buzzing or? Like 15, lead buzzing, uh -huh. like 15. 10 or 15 okay. minutes of lead pipe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, when I can, and these days I can because I'm just stuck at home, you know? <laughs> I haven't been able to practice like this since college. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, me too. Really, I'm practicing more than I ever than I have in years. It's great in that sense. Uh, uh -huh. um, so I start off with with that. Then I do two octaves of long tones. Um, then I usually do some um, Clark studies um, for you know technique, finger technique. Then I do some um, lip slurs. A lot out of the Schlossberg book. Uh, I do tonguing exercises uh, from Arbanes and some stuff that Claudio gave me, Claudio Roditi gave me years ago, and range exercises. And, you mm -hmm. know, I'm just, I focus every day on trying to get better, trying to maintain, and trying to get better, trying to push myself to the next level. So for me, fundamentals are part of my routine every single day. And I have different mm -hmm. kinds of routines depending on how much time I have. Mm -hmm. You know, if, mm -hmm. if, if I have a day where I got to travel and have a sound check and a gig, I'm not going to have a whole lot of time to practice. I have a short warm up routine that still addresses mm -hmm. all the fundamentals. But so, got, you, the, the routine you, 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 you practice, the Bill Adam routine, it's, it's just like the, the, the trumpet player from LA, the Charlie Davis uh, rules? Yeah. Well, Charlie yeah. is a dear friend of mine. In fact, him and Walt Blanton were best friends. Yeah, cool. I have this book, man. I, I, I'm practicing this book every day for many months, man. It's, it's Charlie is a living great. legend. He's, he's yeah. phenomenal. And I think it's the only book about the Bill Adams routine. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a great book. Um, and I gave mine to a student, and I forget, forgot who I gave it to. I need to call Charlie, get another copy. Um, <laughs> but Charlie is a dear friend, and he's a master. You know, and uh -huh. yeah, it's right out of that book. And the routine developed, it changed. <clears throat> you know, and Bill Adams from I've actually studied with several people and done the play the routine with um, several different people. Um, I got a lesson recently from Greg Wing, who's a monster trumpet player and a Bill Adams student. Um, Jerry He was Jeremy, a, he was a he was lit trumpet for too, but reach, right? Greg Wing. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg Wing, yeah, he, he was. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so, let, let, let me translate. É, bom, pessoal, aí eu estou perguntando sobre rotina. Ele falou que assim, ele, ele pratica é, fundamentos, fundamentos todos os dias. Mais ou menos, aí ele, ele tirou a, a, a bomba principal da afinação dele e fez um negócio que chama lead pipe buzzing, que é você tira a bomba principal e sopra no bocal. Isso é uma, é uma é parte de um estudo de um famoso professor de trompete chamado Bill Adam. É, grandes trompetistas tiveram uma aula com o Bill Adam e, e ele tem trabalhado bastante a rotina do Bill Adam. 
né? Então, é, tem feito isso. Então, eu falo assim que tem dias que ele não consegue fazer a rotina inteira, não consegue trabalhar os fundamentos. Ultimamente, agora, por conta dessa quarentena que o mundo inteiro está vivendo, ele está estudando mais do que ele estudava na época de universidade. Então, ele tem feito bastante isso. Aí eu perguntei para ele se a rotina que ele está fazendo do Bill Adam é praticamente aquela que o Charlie Davis, que é um trompetista lá de Los Angeles, escreveu. Ele tem um livro da rotina do Bill Adam, e até que eu tenho esse livro, que é sensacional, e ele falou que é mais ou menos isso mesmo, e que o Charles Davis, esse cara que organizou esses estudos todos, é uma, uma, uma lenda viva, ele é um super trompetista, e era melhor amigo do professor do Kenny. Ok, Kenny. Yeah, so, um, trumpet wise, you know, I just, I make sure that I do, I focus on the fundamentals every day. Even mm -hmm. if it's just for five minutes, I have short version of the routine, but I make sure that I address all those fundamentals um, every day, get my chops working. Um, I said mm -hmm. another great teacher that I had was Bobby Shu. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know I'm leaving some people out, Victor Paz, uh, Laurie Frink. I've, I've, I've had all kinds of amazing teachers through my life. Um, Bobby Shu was one of the most incredible teachers I've ever had. And um, he's been a mentor to me for many years. And I've studied with him online recently. He's still, he's still around. He's still teaching online. If you go to bobbyshoe.com, uh -huh. you know, you can get a lesson with Bobby, man. He's, his breathing concepts, his ideas about chops, equipment, he's, Bobby's a genius. Um, mm -hmm. But I deal with, that's, that's what I practice first and foremost every day. If I have specific music that I'm working on, for instance, today I'm, I uh, did a recording session from home for a friend of mine, Andy Farber. Uh, who's a great writer, saxophone player, teaches at Juilliard. He was musical director for John Hendricks, and he was commissioned to write a thing for Winton Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. So he's um, doing uh, remote recording. So I'm recording the first and second trumpet parts for him for a big band chart he wrote um, and, uh, and, a, and a solo part for him. So I'm doing some remote recording from home. So I was working on that music a little bit. Yesterday... Mm -hmm. I had to record a thing for Winton, for Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra, a uh, piece we're doing um, because of the, the quarantine and everything. Um, nobody can go out. So Jazz Lincoln Center came up with a creative solution to still be able to have their gala. So they're going to do mm -hmm. a virtual gala. So <laughs> as part of the gala, we did a, cl a collaboration with the entire orchestra where every member of the orchestra, except I think one or two, we each wrote a chorus on a, over, over a blues And then we each orchestrated our own chorus, you know, one after another, so we could check out what the person before us wrote and have it develop. Went and inserted some solos. So I have a chorus in there that I orchestrated for the band. Um, each, almost all of us do. Um, and then we record it remotely from home. So when you do that, first the drummer's got to put down uh, the drum part, then the bass, um, then the uh -huh. piano, and then the lead players, and then the section players, so on and so forth. So... So we're working on on that. So yesterday I had a recording session for that. The day before I had a recording session for Sesame Street. So, uh -huh. you know, so w with all that, you know, I'm working on that music from, you know, the stuff for the, the Lincoln Center band. There's some tricky stuff in there. Vince Gardner wrote a really hard chorus with some really tricky articulations, <laughs> you know. So I practiced it for about three days. So, you know, I work on the music that I need to work on as it comes. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of working on music, um, I'm always listening to music um, and, you know, and I love to play tunes, too. So I, I'll put on, you know, I have that app. I think it's called, um, what is it? I Real B? I Real Book. Uh -huh. You know? I Real like B, the app. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I put that on and play along with that, you know, play, play tunes and, you know try and be productive with my time here. This is a tough time for all of us, man, being quarantined, mm -hmm. you know, and we have choices of how we're going to utilize our time right now. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we, we yeah. can sit on the couch and watch Netflix and, you know, and, and snack and eat and get through it and get depressed, which I fell into that too. Or we mm -hmm. can try and find ways to, to be creative. To be productive. And, yeah. And, productive and to, to be productive and to, to find some positivity. In mm -hmm, a negative yeah. situation, you yeah. know. So the positivities, we have time to practice. We have time to do things like this. Um, mm -hmm. I have a nonprofit organization in Las Vegas called Jazz Outreach Initiative that I started mm -hmm. about three years ago, and we just started a youth jazz orchestra. Um, we had six rehearsals and had to shut it down. 
you know, so yeah. we're coming up with ways to keep that going. We're actually doing a collective remote recording with the youth orchestra on a Marcus print, print up arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, okay. To the, the, try to keep the, 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 inspired. Ok, yeah, so, yeah. então o pessoal aqui, aqui falou, bom, ele falou que, que ele, ele faz bastante essas coisas do, do, das rotinas, né, de, de fundamentos todo dia e trabalha depois as coisas que ele precisa tocar. Então, por exemplo, ele falou que ontem, antes ontem, é, não, antes ontem, é, eu acho que foi que ele gravou um projeto para Lincoln Center que eles vão, vão lançar, que é um projeto de gala, é, onde cada um dos membros é, solou uma, uma, alguns coros de blues e durante o solo tiveram que escrever a parte da orquestra. É, então, foi como rodando, né? Cada um escrevia uma parte, então o cara que solava escrevia o background, ele falou que é, um dos músicos escreveu uma coisa bem difícil, que ele ficou estudando essas músicas por mais ou menos três dias para gravar. É, ele falou que é, hoje mesmo ele gravou um negócio para Vila Sésamo, Aliás, agradeço ao Rodrigo por ter me falado a tradução correta. É, gravou hoje mesmo o negócio para Vila Sésamo. E também gravou uma outra coisa também, que é, um amigo dele, que foi um arranjador, que ia fazer um. um essa semana ia fazer o, é, um repertório lá na, na Jazz at Lincoln Center. E, e não pôde fazer, obviamente, por conta da quarentena. E, mas aí o cara resolveu gravar todo mundo à distância, as músicas que eles iam tocar. Então ele está fazendo a parte de primeiro e de segundo trompete. Então ele fez a primeira trompete e fez alguns solos <risos> também. Então assim, ele tá, falou que está aproveitando esse momento todo, em invés de ficar no sofá, no Netflix, está tentando ser produtivo e fazer coisas criativas para passar esse momento todo. Uh, Kenny, Daniel is here, is, is asking you to write the names of your teachers. I don't. I don't know how to comment on that. I was just looking at that. I don't know okay. how to make make comments. No, you, uh, no, okay. After that, you can you can write on the our me messenger chat on Facebook. Well, Daniel, Daniel, yeah, Daniel and I are friends on Facebook. So send yeah. me a message on Facebook, Daniel, and I'll, I'm happy to write the names of my teachers for you. Okay. Good to so, see you, bro. <laughs> uh, so we have a, a question here about how. How do you develop your sight reading? Your sight reading. Is, yeah, you said that you're good at, at sight reading. How do you develop that? I learned how to sight read from my mom. Oh, really? um, she, she was a great sight reader, played piano. And I remember it was the summer before I went into high school, from the, when I went from eighth grade to ninth grade. So, you know, I was, I don't know, 14 or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to be able to make the top jazz band in high school. And I was mm -hmm. afraid I, would, I wouldn't because I wasn't good at sight reading. And mm -hmm. so I talked to my mom about it. Now, my mom and dad had divorced by then. So my dad wasn't around. He was a great musician, but um, he wasn't around. Um, and so my mom used to sit me down, like, in the piano room. We had a little room in the, in the, in the house where she had her piano. And it had a bookshelf filled with piano music, the entire bookshelf. And she sat me down in that room with a music stand. And every day she pulled down a different, uh, different book from the bookshelf of piano music, opened it up to a random page and said, okay, here, sight read this page, mm -hmm. you know, and don't stop. Do it in time. Keep your foot tapping. Do it in time and don't stop. Mm -hmm. And um, don't go back and fix anything. Mm -hmm. So I would do that. I would screw up, but I would keep going. And then she said, okay, here's another page. I'll find another page. Mm -hmm. Di you know, different page. And I did that every day uh -huh. for, the, for the entire summer. And by the end of the summer, by the time I got to high school, I was, I was probably the best sight reader in the, in the band. You know, cool. well, you, you practice sight reading by doing it just like anything else. You're uh -huh. not going to get good at anything unless you do it. You're not going to learn how to play in the upper register unless you practice playing in the upper register. It's not going to yeah. just happen one day because you want it. You uh -huh. got to practice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sight reading the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bom, pessoal, perguntei para ele sobre ele. Falou, ele tinha comentado que ele era... Tô, I'm recharging my, my cell phone here, Kenny. Uh, cool. So, ele, ele, ele perguntou sobre... Eu perguntei para ele, ele tinha dito que ele é bom para... Sobre leitura à primeira vista, né? 
Aí eu perguntei para ele o que, que ele fez para melhorar a leitura da primeira vista. Ele falou que ele melhorou muito a leitura da primeira vista dele é, com a mãe dele. A mãe dele era uma, fazia muito bem a leitura da primeira vista e, e, e falou que ele ficava... Ela chegou, pegou um monte de livro de piano e colocou na frente dele e falou assim, agora você, vai, você pode... É, tocar, ele ficava tocando as músicas, da primeira ele errava tudo depois ele foi melhorando, melhorando, melhorando e aí foi, foi desenvolvendo essa leitura é, à primeira vista é... So we have a question here é... How is your psychologic prepare to when you have to play a solo or when you have a, a difficult part to play And you know that the, the emotional part of playing trumpet, do you have any, any advice for it? Breathe. Don't forget to breathe. Mm -hmm. No, we're lucky because a trumpet is a breath instrument, right? You've got to take a good mm -hmm. breath to play it. Breathing is also a very important part of meditation. Mm -hmm. Important part of, of um, yoga, tai chi, martial arts, all, all these, you know, deep breathing um, centers you, it calms your mind, it focuses you. You know, mm -hmm. I used to suffer from, I used to suffer from extreme anxiety when I would play. I even, there was a period where I was subbing out of gigs because I was too nervous to go play. I had too much anxiety. Um, I would actually mm -hmm. get physically sick. Um, and breathing, I started studying yoga. Um, mm -hmm. I started doing meditation, you know, so I, I actively focus on taking very deep breaths in through my nose, out through my mouth. I get nervous every time I perform. I, I really, mm -hmm. I still, I still do. Um, mm -hmm. First thing I had to do is understand why I get nervous. I get nervous because I care, you know, and that's mm -hmm. a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want, it's, and it's not necessarily so much about my ego. Of course, I want to sound good. And I appreciate when um, people recognize that but I want the music to sound good. Mm -hmm. You know, I care about the music and that's, that's why I get nervous because I want to make sure that the music is uh, treated properly by me. And, you know, so before every performance I do, I find, find a corner somewhere where nobody's looking at me and I take three or four deep breaths in through my nose and out through my mouth and it just centers me, it calms me down. And I do that mm -hmm. on stage quite often too, mm -hmm. while I'm in concert. If I got a solo coming up, You know, when I have time to do it, um, you know, I, I do that. Nobody, nobody knows you do it. Nobody sees you or pays attention. You're just breathing, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in through the nose, out through the mouth, it calms my mind down. It relaxes me and helps me to focus and also helps me to expand my lung capacity and get a bigger breath, be able to play longer phrases and have more control over the trumpet. Mm -hmm. you know, focus on breathing, you know, so mm -hmm. that's um, psychologically how I prepare. Um, tá. if, if that answers that question. Ok. Bom, você, o, aqui é o que a gente teve uma, uma pergunta aqui do Nathan, perguntando sobre é, como é o preparo psicológico dele quando está indo para o palco para fazer um solo. Ele falou assim que a, a nossa sorte é que o trompete é um instrumento de sopro, né, que a gente precisa ficar respirando sempre. É, então, uma coisa é que ele, ele sofria muito de, de ansiedade, ele tinha ele tinha problemas sérios de ansiedade, de até passar mal fisicamente de tanta ansiedade, não de não fazer alguns trabalhos por conta de ansiedade. Então ele começou a fazer yoga. E a yoga ajudou muito ele com esse negócio, e a meditação também ajudou muito ele. Então uma coisa que ele fala é que ele faz isso antes de entrar no palco e até durante os concertos, de respirar pelo nariz e soltar pela boca umas três vezes, por exemplo, que isso acalma ele. É, e também sempre respira bem, sempre respira bem e respirar tranquilo, isso acaba ajudando é, é, o, a lance de, de, da, da, da concentração e do preparo psicológico. É, uh, let me see here. Uh, just have more questions here. Yeah, it's a, a question here. How how is how, how is how is to be playing with uh, Winter Marsalis? On... Say that again. You froze for a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. How how, how is to play with Winton? It's it, 
on a daily basis, you know that how is the he is is I think he is the, the the lead of the band, right? So how is he, he deals with the band about the musicality and some parts that are difficult and about swing and, and everything? How, how is the how is is the is the working uh, with Winton? How is the work with the Winton? Um, working with Winton is great. He um. He's the band leader for sure. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, he plays fourth trumpet in the section. So he follows Ryan Kaiser. He follows our lead player. Um, the band in certain ways is treated much like a collective. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, my computer came unplugged. Let me plug it back in. Okay. Um, the band has 10 or 11 arrangers in it. So we're all arranging, writing and arranging music for the band to play. So, and we play mm -hmm. new music all the time. One project uh -huh. to the next, it's always new music coming in. Mm -hmm. So depending on who wrote the, the composition or the arrangement, that's who runs the rehearsal for that segment of the rehearsal. So if Victor Goins brings something in, uh, Victor kind of runs the rehearsal for his tune. If I bring something in, I run the rehearsal for my tune. Mm -hmm. um, Winton will make suggestions to us. He'll take us to the side and say, hey, think about voicing this this way for the saxophones or whatever. Give us suggestions and have us look at things. And um, he's definitely the band leader, but he's open to everybody being leaders at, at the same time. And if there's anything that anybody in the band is hearing that isn't right, um, we all chime in. We all speak up. We listen to each other. And Winton, Winton is very open to that and wants to hear it because – the collective is greater than the individual and he'll be the first one to say that, you know, and mm -hmm. I'll hear something sometimes in, you know, where, where there'll be a note that, that there's a discre discrepancy between me and the second alto or something. And I'll, you know, say something to Winton, and we'll look at it. And so the band is really in many ways treated like a collective and we mm -hmm. all have a voice uh, during the rehearsals <coughs> and how it's, how it goes. And we can all make suggestions about nuance and anything else. The musical mm -hmm. aspects of the band, um, which is very nice. I've been in other situations where it's just a leader, and you don't really have any say, and you got to play it exactly as the leader says to play it, and that's it. Um, okay. With Lincoln Center, it's very much a collective, um, and Winton is very good at leading that concept. You know that that kind of idea for an entire band. So he's he's a great leader to work for, in many many ways. Oh. Okay. Bom, aí eu perguntei para ele, gente, já que vocês não estão fazendo nenhuma pergunta, né? Nunca vi um negócio desse. É... Gente, assim, vamos, vamos, vamos falar um pouco mais, assim, por exemplo. Ok. Ô, Cristóvão, por exemplo, essa, essa pergunta, tipo, como ele treina escalas e arvejos, é, essas perguntas do tipo, ah, putz, se o Marsalis é o único que toca monete no naipe, Gente, é só, só dar uma olhada aqui e ver, assim, tá? Então, assim, nós vamos, vamos, vamos pegar esse tempo aqui para fazer perguntas mais legais. Eu fiz uma pergunta aqui para ele é, sobre como que é tocar com o Winton Marsalis, né? Que é essa lenda do trompete. Ele é um líder da banda, realmente ele é um líder, mas como que é trabalhar com ele? Como ele dirige um ensaio e tal e tudo mais? E ele falou que é muito bom trabalhar com ele. É uma coisa muito interessante. Ele falou que a Lincoln Center, não, ele não é... Apesar de ele ser um líder, o Marsalis, ele tem vários arranjadores e compositores na banda. Então, quando você tem uma música que é de alguém que escreveu, é, essa pessoa que escreveu que vai liderar o um ensaio. É, é assim, ele, ele faz, o Ito Marsalis faz algumas observações, em alguns momentos, em alguns voices, em algumas nuances, mas eles encaram a banda mais como um coletivo, Entendeu? É, como um coletivo onde todo mundo é líder e o Ethan Marsalis ele é muito bom nessa história de, de compartilhar essa liderança com os outros então assim, não é uma coisa do tipo uma banda que uma pessoa só decide tudo, não, falou que a banda inteira é, se decide uma coisa interessante que ele falou, apesar do Ethan Marsalis ser o líder da banda ele, ele é quarto trompete e ele é liderado pelo Ryan Kaiser que é o primeiro trompete então é isso daí é... 
Let me see here. I have a question here. Is Lies is is asking about your new plunger, plunger mute? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he wants to know more details about about the, the plunger. <clears throat> All right. Well, it's gonna it's getting closer. It's been a long process in, in creating this thing, um, step by step by step. Um, I won't go through the entire process of what it is, but we're finally to the point where we have um, somebody who's made a mold for us, a metal mold, and we got our first production line plunger. Mm -hmm. um, I have it here. This is it. Um, they messed up on the logo. I don't know if you can, you can see, but um, so we're having they have to redo the mold to get the logo so it's correct but this this is mm -hmm. it it's got you know we call this the kenny penny it's got ah, a penny cool. here and then um where's the camera at there's a penny on the inside mm -hmm. here and if you can see you turn this penny yeah. it turns uh -huh. one on the inside so it cool. opens it up so my air can come out but uh -huh. this is it um i can't play in my apartment now it's too late but you know this plunger actually works with a regular straight mute, with especially these ones. This is a Vacchiano Alessi straight mute. Uh -huh. um, you can use that as a pixie mute instead of the little stuffy pixie mute that uh -huh. everybody uses. Uh -huh. And the plunger fits over this. So it's it's a much uh, freer blow um, with uh -huh. this setup. But um, so anyways, right now we're waiting on the person to correct the logo and the mold. And then that should be by next week. And then they're going to take pictures and send it to, to me and my partner. And if the logo looks good, then we're going to go into production and we should be getting the first uh, box of 100 plungers within a month. Okay. Um, so one, once we see that the logo is good, um, we're going we're gonna to start pre-orders for it. So it should be in the next couple of weeks we'll be cool, able to start pre-orders for the, the plunger. But that's it. But I'm yeah. a total Beautiful. mute nerd, you know. Yeah, really. I had this. I had a recording like session it. I mentioned today where he wanted a. He, he said a, a trumpet solo a la Sweets Edison. You know, it was kind of a bassy style chart, you know, and mm -hmm. he wanted the harmon mute with the stem that you know Sweets Edison sound. And I actually have a harmon mute that used to belong. It was Sweet Ed Edison's harmon mute. Oh and God! I got really? that right here. Yeah. <laughs> this was cool. Sweets harmon mute. So I used this for this recording session today. Jeez, yeah. And then, <laughs> Some of it was for hat mute. This is an old, like, this is the real hat mute. You know, okay, back in the day. Uh, you know, yeah. Made uh -huh. by a company called Elton. So I'm, I'm uh -huh. a total mute mute nerd. I, I love it. I've got a closet full of probably like 200 mutes. Really? 200? <laughs> yeah, easily. Yeah, cool. Bom, bom, aí o, o Islã aqui perguntou sobre a plunger mute, essa plunger que é uma, um desentupidor, né? Que ele que ele está desenvolvendo, cara. E assim é muito legal. Você viu, vocês viram que é, ele viu, vocês viram que tem uma moedinha ali que ele consegue, é, ele vai girando essa moedinha e vai mudando a, a quantidade de som que sai da campana. E uma coisa bem interessante. Eu não sei se vocês sabem, mas existe uma surdina que chama Pixie Mute, que você coloca uma surdinazinha pequenininha que você coloca dentro do trompete para você usar junto com a plunge. E é uma bem pequenininha, poucas pessoas têm, para falar a verdade. E nessa surdina que ele desenvolveu, por ser maior, você, ao invés de usar Pixie, você usa a Straight Mute. E é bem legal. E ele estava tá contando aqui que é, no Sesame Street, na Vila Sesame, que ele estava gravando, uma das gravações, uma das faixas que ele teve que gravar, era fazer um solo parecido com o é, Sweet Z, que, é, que com, com, com a plunger, com a plunger não, com a, com a Harmon, com o copinho é, um pouco para fora, né? E ele falou que ele tem essa Harmon aí ó, que ele tá mostrando, essa Harmon é do Sweet Edson, é do, do próprio cara, o compositor falou para tocar tipo igual o Sweet Edson, com a surdina com o som do Sweet Edson e ele falou que ele tem a surdina <risos> do próprio Sweet Edson, então ele acabou gravando bem interessante isso, e ele falou que ele é um nerd de surdinas, ele falou que ele tem mais de 200 é, mais de 200 surdinas <risos> So we have a question here from Niraldo. He's a guy from the northeast of the country. He said that he came to Brazil and he, uh, he, he, you played in Recife in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you like played, five years ago, I remember, yeah. Yeah, yeah you played Frevo. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, how would it, it was like for you to play that that kind of music? Man, it's hard. It was it was a lot of fun, man. That's some hard music, a lot of articulation in it, man. You got a tongue. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, a lot. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. But the great people, man, great, great music. It was it was very challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, not easy music to play. It was fun. Yeah. No at all, man. I, I think only those guys know knows how to play that music, really. Here yeah. in Sao Paulo, we don't know how to play that. <laughs> I, just, I, did, I just did my best, man. You know? <laughs> those guys are really good, though. Yeah, they're great. O Miralda aqui perguntou o que ele achou das experiências tocando no Brasil, que ele tocou frevo lá em Recife em 2015. Eu perguntei isso para ele, ele falou que pô, é uma música muito difícil, umas articulações muito complicadas, uma música muito interessante, é, que ele gostou, é, que ele gostou bastante de tocar, deu o máximo dele, é, mas é isso. É... Let me see, we have more questions here. É... É... Uh -huh. Plunger. Uh, about your the, the trumpet books you study, you mm -hmm. you are studying now or have studied? Which which books do you you, you practice um, a lot? Oh, well, like I mentioned before, the Arben's book, uh, Max Schlossberg, the the you know, lift flexibilities, um, Harold Mitchell, um, the. Uh, The Beach Book, uh, Etudes. Um, did I say Herbert L. Clark Technical Studies? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the, all the standard books that, you know, all trumpet players study out of. You know, I've, I've studied out of all of those. Um, I've memorized many of the exercises from them, so I don't actually use the books right now. I just I go by memory, and depending on how my chops feel, what I need to work on. I'm mm -hmm. having an issue with, with something. And of course, the Bill Adams routine and the different things okay. that he has in there, the expanding scales and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. Tá. Bom, aí ele falou o. É, quem perguntou aqui? É, Ricardo Vidal aqui perguntou sobre os, quais os livros que ele usa, né? É, ele falou que ele usa, como ele tinha falado, o, o Arban, o Schlossberg, o Clark, é, a rotina do Bill Adams, do jeito que ele falou, Beach que é um estudo, um livro de estudo, ele falou que ele não usa mais os livros, que ele já decorou grande parte deles, então ele, ele basicamente toca isso. É uma pergunta sobre o seu your estilo de uh, jazz e prof. Uh, o cara aqui está dizendo que ele pode notar que é muito baseado em blues. Uh, the, it, it was an influence of, uh, from with Ray Charles, or, uh, é uma influência de jogar com Ray Charles? It's the, the way that you develop your improvisation style. Well, you know, when, when I was younger, I played a lot of notes. Um, and I used to really, I tried to play fast, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I did pretty good at it. Um, when I got with Ray Charles' band, um, Ray didn't want to hear any of that shit. He didn't want to hear, you know, I was practicing Woody Shaw. I was transcribing Woody Shaw and... Um, When I got with Ray, Ray wanted to hear the blues. You know, I remember, you know, this, this happened actually before I got in the band. Another great, a great saxophone player who, who was playing with him in rehearsal was playing a solo. Ray caught off the band, you know, and, you know, this is kind of a famous story with monk guys in the band. He stopped the band and yelled at the saxophone player and said, quit playing all that enharmonic bullshit. You know, play the blues, <laughs> you know. You know, and I found that the stuff that I was studying in school and that like a lot of the younger players thought was cool or hip, when I got into the real world, they didn't want to hear that. Ray Charles didn't want to hear it. Um, Jimmy McGriff certainly didn't want to hear it. Jimmy was all about the blues. Panama Francis didn't want to hear it. You know, it's like all the stuff that, you know, I was learning in school and that I was, you know, thought was hip band leaders in the real world like no man you know mm -hmm. you got to deal with you got to deal with the tradition you got to understand the harmony that's written you don't you don't reharmonize every solo every song that you play they didn't want to hear any of that and so mm -hmm. i kind of just stopped doing it you know and um i was pretty young and pretty influential or you know pretty um 
um, what's the word? Uh, pretty heavily influenced by those musicians, by Ray Charles and Jimmy McGriff mm -hmm. and Panama Francis. My, those are the first three professional gigs mm -hmm. I had. And they were all about playing blues. They're all about playing melody. Mm -hmm. um, they were not about playing licks. They're like, man, do not play any like rehash bebop licks that you learned at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to hear any bebop licks. They don't want to hear you play riffs or licks. Um, mm -hmm. They want you to create melodies and to develop themes and ideas and to truly improvise and for it to have feeling. You know, and man, there's nobody who had more feeling than Ray Charles to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, Ray, I was heavily influenced by Ray Charles. My playing and the sound that I get and my approach is heavily mm -hmm. influenced by Ray Charles, absolutely. Oh, um, and by Jimmy McGriff. Um, mm -hmm. That's just, you know, I, that's how I hear things. Mm -hmm. And I actually kind of sifted some things out of my playing because mm -hmm. they were kind of meaningless. It was more about trying to impress somebody than it was about actually making music. Cool. Well, o Rodrigo aqui perguntou uma pergunta bem interessante de como ele desenvolveu o estilo de improviso. É, percebi que é muito baseado no blues. É, isso foi uma influência. Isso pergunta se foi uma influência de tocar com o Ray Charles. Ele falou que sim. Ele falou que quando ele entrou na banda do Ray Charles, ele era aquele trompetista jovem que, como a maioria é, de tocar muitas notas e muitas notas e muitas notas. E ele, quando ele tem uma história muito famosa, que um grande saxofonista do, do Ray Charles ele levantou para improvisar e começou a solar, e aí o Ray Charles parou a banda. Tô. E o Ray Charles parou a banda e falou assim, para de tocar essas coisas enarmônicas. Vem aqui, Rafael. Vem, vem, vem. Pode vir, pode vir. É son. Yeah, yeah. É. É. <coughs> e para de tocar essas coisas enarmônicas e parou. Então, ele tem falado, <risos> ele tem falado que... Que, é, que no mundo real é diferente do mundo, né, da, da, da universidade e tal. É, e falou que as pessoas, no, no mundo real as pessoas querem ouvir melodias, querem ouvir tema, querem ouvir frase, querem ouvir esse tipo de coisa, e não ouvir licks. Falou que o Jimmy McGriff, que é um, um organista, é 100% blues, falou que o Ray Charles era blues, então eles querem ouvir temas, eles querem ouvir feeling, né, o, o trompetista tem a feeling <risos> e desenvolva <risos> e desenvolva temas. É, ok, Bruno is asking here about how was the preparation to play lead singer with Mingo's big band. Um, you know, I had never really played much lead trumpet before, um, and it kind of came up out of necessity um, because the Mingo's big band. <coughs> was being led by Sue Mingus, who, by the way, just turned 90 years old a couple days ago. And oh, God, God bless her. Um, amazing, amazing woman. But she didn't know music uh, intimate the musicians do. And so she uh -huh. would call three, three trumpet players to play in the band, and they'd be three great players, but not necessarily lead players. All strong uh -huh. soloists. And the Mingus Big Band was an interesting situation because it was really like a big, small group. <coughs> you know, enough people for a big band, but it was, you know, most of the people were in, in that band. It, it's really about the solos and using Mingus's compositions as vehicles to express yourself and to, and to play solos. And although there's been some great charts written for that band and um, there are some, some terrific recordings with the ensemble playing, um, the main focus of the band is really about people playing solos and the ensemble playing kind of took a back seat a lot of times in, in that band. And so I was at a gig one night, you know, with a band and it was myself. I won't name the other trumpet players, but it, it was two other guys who had no interest in playing lead. They never played any lead and they were known as solos and their world class, absolute genius trumpet players were very famous. Um, and neither one of them were interested in playing lead. So by default, I sat in the lead chair mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so I, I did my best and, you know, I'm not a, you know, I don't have high chops, you know, like so many great players, like, you know, I'm the most obviously like John Faddis or, or like Walter White or, um, 
Um, Alex Sipiagin is a great lead trumpet player. Um, really? I, I don't. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I didn't know um, that. Yeah, he's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but you know, I read well. I I can play well in tune. You know, I understand phrasing, um, playing with confidence. You know, so I did a good good enough job where people were like, hey man, you sound good on lead. You know, you should do it more often. And, and so I started doing it a little more often. And then a tour came up um, where Sue asked me to play lead on the tour. Sue Mingus asked me to play lead on the tour. And I was really nervous about it because I'd, I'd never done it like that night after night. I'd done it a couple times now, like three or four times maybe at the regular Thursday night gig at the time. And um, so I said, okay. And I called Bobby Shu, talked to him about it. And Bobby said, what mouthpiece are you playing on? I told him, he said, you need a different mouthpiece. You know, that's one thing Bobby talks about, you know, is you got to have the right equipment for the job. He said, you don't, if you're going to hammer a nail on the wall to hang a picture on and you don't use a sledgehammer, you got to have the right tool. You know, so Bobby basically designed a lead mouthpiece for me that Greg Black really? made. Yeah. Cool. Um, Greg <coughs> Black makes my mouthpieces. So I have my regular mouthpiece and I have my lead version of it um and i started using that and started working more on playing lead and the thing is with amingus big band because it's more like a big small group the lead trumpet player if you play something down an octave nobody even cares or notices no, most of the time you yeah. know it's about the phrasing is about it's about playing that music and the spirit of that music yeah. um, so or if you go for it and miss you know it wasn't as bad as if, if i were playing lead with another band and not making mm -hmm. it so I could take chances and didn't have to worry so much about missing it because the ensemble playing wasn't, you know, like if you do that on a Broadway show, uh, uh, you're fired. You'll never get called again. You know? Yes. So it was, it was a very different situation. So it allowed me to get experience, you know, playing with Amigas big band playing lead, um, gave me an opportunity where it allowed me to get the experience of doing it. And at the same time I was calling Bobby shoe and asking for, for advice he gave me great advice that I can share if you want. Um, and yeah, sure. sure. And it, it taught me the importance of music versus high notes. Cause I know a lot of guys who are great high note trumpet players who were horrible lead trumpet players. Yes. You know, it's and, totally different. Yeah. It's totally different. You know, for me playing lead is, is about the music. It's, and it's about yes. leading the phrase. It's about the phrasing, the sound. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's so, not only high notes. Yeah. yeah, you have to be able to do that, but yeah. that's, you know, yeah. So, um, I mean, God bless Sue Minga. She helped me to become a better trumpet player because that experience of getting to play lead with that band for, for a period made me a better trumpet player. It made me focus mm -hmm. on things I'd never focused on. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, really, it really helped my career get to the next level uh, oh. because of that and all the focus that I did on just physically playing the trumpet and becoming a better trumpet player to be able to play lead. It opened up doors for me commercially mm -hmm. where I was able to start to do some Broadway work, some, some more commercial work. Yeah. Um, it, it made me a better trumpet player. So, yeah. Yeah. They try, and the, the, the lead trumpet playing, it's like a, you have to practice it as a soldier, you know, that you have to do your fundamentals every day. You know, you have to, yeah. to know how to pace everything. It, it, it's hard. Bom, no é, yeah. é, o Bruno aqui perguntou como foi ele tocar é, lead trumpet com a Mingus Big Band. Ele falou que é, é uma banda, a Mingus Big Band nunca foi uma banda é, que foi, for, foi formada pela, pela, é, pela esposa do, do Mingus e, e ela não tinha muita noção da, das coisas. Então ela chamou três trompetistas muito fortes em solistas, né, em como ser solista. É, são três solistas muito fortes e desses três assim, tinham dois que eram muito famosos assim muito bons assim então ele naturalmente acabou entrando na, na cadeira do, do, do primeiro trompete porque não tinha como ele estar falando não, não vou fazer primeiro trompete com dois grandes trompetistas tocando o segundo e o terceiro grandes solistas né então, foi uma, uma, uma experiência muito importante para ele que ajudou muito ele a ser músico, né? Então ele começou a fazer lead lá e as pessoas falaram puta que legal, você tá tocando lead legal, pode ficar. E aí teve uma turnê que aí a esposa lá do Domingos é, falou para ele continuar como lead trumpet. E a primeira coisa que ele fez foi ligar para Bob Shield e perguntar para ele o que fazer, 
né? como ele vai tocar a primeira trompete, porque ele não está acostumado com isso. Então o Bob Shill, ele fez um, meio que pensou no bocal pro, pro Kenny, e a Greg Black fez esse bocal, baseado no bocal que ele já usava, para fazer ele trumpet, e ele falou uma coisa interessante, que no Amigos Big Band, é, o primeiro trompete não tem aquela obrigação de fazer primeiro trompete, é porque eles utilizam a música do Mingus apenas como veículo, entendeu? Para todo mundo ficar solando. É, então o primeiro trompete não tem aquela obrigação que algumas outras, as outras bandas têm. Ele falou que ele consegue tocar, ele não é um especialista em primeiro trompete, mas consegue tocar afinado e consegue frasear. E ele falou que o Bob Schill falou uma coisa muito importante para ele, que é, primeiro trompete não é tocar notas agudas, né? É, primeiro trompete é... É, falou que conhece caras que tocam muito bem notas agudas, mas são primeiros trompetes horríveis, né? porque uma coisa não está relacionada à outra, você tem que saber tocar agudo, obviamente, mas o mais importante do primeiro trompete é o fraseado, é a condução da banda, é muito mais do que apenas tocar agudo, né? muito mais a coisa do, do fraseado e, e da liderança. É... Okay, so Kenny, let's go to the last question, okay? I think that it's very, uh -huh. it's, it's, a, it's a very long <coughs> stream because of, of all the problems we we got here. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, uh, how? What's your advice? For uh, a young, a young uh, improviser, jazz improviser, how what's the best way to start to improvise uh, jazz improvisation on, on trumpet? You got to do it every day. You got to play every day. You mm -hmm. got to find like-minded people to play with. Right now, it's kind of hard to do that with everybody quarantined. But you can do yeah. it with that with I, the iReal book app, whatever it's called. Um, mm -hmm. But and you got to listen to the music. You know, mm -hmm. it's a language. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to be able to speak Portuguese. Unless I listen to people speaking Portuguese, I'm not going to get to I'm not going to understand it and be able to converse with anybody by by reading a book occasionally mm -hmm. and or by looking at pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you got to immerse yourself in the language. You know, mm -hmm. I would have I would have to move there and and spend you know time interacting with other people. Same thing with jazz music. You got to listen to the music. Yeah, so, do, 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 do you transcribe a lot songs? I don't songs a lot. It's interesting. I don't now. I used to. Marcus Printup um, transcribes a lot, and he always mm -hmm. has. Winter Marcellus mm -hmm. doesn't transcribe. I just saw. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked Arturo Sandoval about that, and Arturo, Arturo does not transcribe solos. He says he never did. Mm -hmm. But when you listen to Arturo play, he's speaking the language, you know, and he's listened to so much Dizzy Gillespie and so much of the music. He's immersed himself in the in that language. He understands it and he can speak it um, mm -hmm. without having to transcribe it. Different people are different, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's great to transcribe. I think it's a great tool but it's mostly ear training. And if you transcribe okay. and you write it down, you can, uh, and analyze it, you can learn a lot and it's, it's, it's nothing but good. But in terms mm -hmm. of like, when you improvise, when you're playing, you got to be speaking the language. You have to really mm -hmm. understand it. So you got to listen. You got to listen to the music all the time. If you want to play it, there's no other okay. way. Okay. Listening is the utmost of, of, of importance. Yeah. Ok. Bom, eu pego, fiz uma última pergunta aqui para a gente encerrar, pessoal. Qual seria a dica dele <coughs> para você começar a improvisar? Ou se você for jovem ou não? Acho que é uma pergunta bem interessante. Ele falou assim: você tem que praticar todos os dias. É, você tem que arrumar alguém para tocar. Nesses momentos de, de quarentena, seria legal você usar aquele aplicativo iRealB, que tem no, tanto para Android quanto para iOS. É importante tocar, tocar todos os dias, porque é uma linguagem. Ele nunca vai conseguir falar português se ele não ouvir portu é, linguagem, a língua portuguesa. Ele não vai, você precisa aprender, você precisa tocar, 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 tocar sempre que você pode. Aí eu perguntei para ele se ele transcreve. Ele falou que ele já chegou a transcrever bastante, que foi muito importante para o treinamento auditivo, 
mas ele falou que o Winton Marsalis não transcreve, nunca transcreveu nada, falou que o Marcos Print, tá, ele transcreve bastante, falou que o Arturo Sandoval não transcreve, é, mas essas pessoas elas estão imersas na linguagem do jazz, então elas acabam falando essa linguagem. Bom, então é isso, pessoal. Eu vou me despedir deles aqui, dele aqui e daqui a pouco eu volto para falar com vocês. So, Kenny, thank you so yeah. much for your time, man. Thank you My so pleasure, much. Bro. Yeah, I hope you stay safe in New York. New York, there's a lot of cases of death, right? Yeah, oh, it's COVID, crazy. Yeah. I, and I, I live in Midtown Manhattan. Um, yeah. But we're just, you know, I got a mask and I got gloves and, you know. Yeah, yeah please. All my hazmat gear, if I got to go to the grocery stores or even, you know, even check the mail, you know, it's uh -huh. this, stuff, this thing is for real. So, um, you know, we got to all be safe out here, man. Take care of yourself. Yeah. The, you too, man. What, what the situation is in, in, in Brazil right now, but, mm -hmm. you know, be safe, man. Be well. Okay, man. You too. Thank yeah. you so much, Kenny. All See right, you soon, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye.